ignore the echo and fight through it, uh, unless there's anything you guys can do to fix that. Um, maybe you just did, so that sounds great, actually. Can you guys still hear me all right? All right, I'm, I'm going to assume you guys can still uh, still hear me here. Um, we can hear you. You're good to go. Okay, perfect. Well, so uh, a little history on me. Uh, like Rollins said, I graduated from BYU back in 97. I actually have never known any other business than the financial services industry. I, I started working for MetLife in 1997. I went independent about uh, 2001, and I really – I have just loved this industry. Uh, starting in 2001, I, I, I began developing what I call a three-bucket presentation, which ended up being the Power Zero presentation, and basically said, hey, look, there's, there's three basic types of investments out there. Um, I like to refer to them as buckets of money. You've got your taxable bucket, your tax deferred bucket, tax-free bucket. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Client, you have most of your money in the taxable and tax deferred bucket. Let's try to get it into the tax-free bucket because nobody wants to pay tax in retirement. So start off as like a five-minute presentation. And um, every so often, something would pop out of my mouth, and I'm like, that actually sounded pretty good. The client responded reasonably well to it. I got a good result, so I'm going to include that in the next presentation. Well, over the course of about 15 years, maybe 10, 10 to 12 years, um, that that presentation got honed and, re, and you know, refined and uh, deconstructed and reconstructed and evolved, and finally to the point where um, when I gave that presentation to uh, groups of people, groups of prospects, they wanted to buy life insurance from me just about every time. And so um, in 2014, I decided, well, there's some instances where people aren't able to see me live, so how great would it be if I actually wrote a book that gave them the presentation in book format? So I wrote the book. It actually only took me about a week because it was simply regurgitating uh, everything that was in my presentation and putting it on paper, polishing it up a, get, a bit, fleshing it out with a few examples, and then that was the book. So I wrote the book, I crossed my fingers, I threw it out on Amazon and just waited to see what happened. And uh, to my utter, utter disbelief, people started buying the books. And then I started getting feedback from people saying, hey, Dave, I handed your book out and they came back to me and they wanted to buy life insurance from me. So it was the darndest thing. And um, that book actually went on to so sell um, 140,000 copies. Um, which to me surpassed all of my most wildest expectations. Um, I got a call from MDRT. They said, Dave, we've got your book. We love it. We want you to give your presentation at the worldwide annual conference for a million dollar roundtable in Toronto, Canada, which I did in 2014. I was asked by uh, Fortune, uh, Fortune um, uh, Forum 400 in 2015 to go speak to them. And Forum 400 is the top. 1% of all life insurance agents in the country. Um, keep in mind, I'm still, doing, I'm still doing personal production this whole time. I'm still top of the table producer, which basically means take whatever you need to do to accomplish million dollar round table status and multiply that times five. And that's what I was doing year in and year out. Um, and now I mentor hundreds and hundreds of advisors across the nation on power of zero financial planning. So. So now that we've got that introduction out of the way, let's talk about what is the basic premise of the book, The Power of Zero. Why is it striking a nerve with people? Well, the first chapter in the book, we basically talk about how experts all across the country, uh, those who have studied history that are good at math and they're good at, uh, you know, so op opening up the books um, of the federal government and, and taking account of what's going on in our country, they're all predicting that in the next 10 years, tax rates will have to rise dramatically. Some are even predicting that tax rates will have to double or our country is going to go broke. Uh, and to give you an example of that, um, we actually in the last six months have been filming a documentary of The Power of Zero. And in that documentary, basically crisscrossed the country and we interviewed 
all of the most important experts in our country that have anything meaningful to say about our country's national debt and the unfunded obligations like Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And they're all looking at the numbers, and they're all saying the same thing. Tax rates have to double or we're going to go broke. Let me give you an example of that. Um, we've heard of Ed Slot. We've heard of Tom Hagman. I don't know if you heard of a guy named Don Blanton. Um, David Walker, former Comptroller General of the federal government under Bush and Clinton. These guys are all looking at the country's books and they're saying, look, something doesn't add up. There's a dirty little secret in Washington that nobody wants to talk about, and that dirty little secret is called math. David Walker says there is a four-letter word that can explain why tax rates have to double. He was actually on a radio show uh, back in 2010. He'd written a book called Comeback America where he uh, described our country's problem. And he appeared on NPR to talk about the book. He said, hey, look, tax rates have to double uh, or we're going to go broke. And the radio show host just didn't believe him. He said, hey, look, I can give you one four-letter word that explains why tax rates have to double. And she couldn't guess what it was. So they opened up the phone line. And people started to call in, and nobody could figure out what the one four-letter word was to explain why tax rates have to double. And finally, he told them. He said, hey, look, tax rates have to double because of math, M-A-T-H. Math is a four-letter word. What does that mean? That means, like, if this were your personal household and you had $2,000 uh, coming into your house, but you had $4,000 going out on bills, basically is what he says. He's saying, look, you either have to double taxes reduce spending by half or some combination of the two or the country is going to go pro. I remember I was giving my Power Zero flagship presentation to a little group of people in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin in 2009. This is two days before midterm elections in 2009. And um, people came up to me after their presentation. They said, Dave, 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 who should we vote for? Who should we vote for? And I remember telling them it doesn't matter who you vote for because whoever gets elected is going to inherit a math problem, the solution to which involves either doubling taxes, reducing spending by half, or some combination of the two. Now, let me give you an example of why our country finds uh, itself in this current position. If you take a look at Social Security, when Social Security first came out, how many workers were putting money into Social Security for every one person that took money out? Anybody know what that ratio looked like. It was 42 to 1. You had 42 workers putting money into Social Security for every one person that took money out. And back then, how old did you have to be? This is 1935 when it first came out, by the way. How old did you have to be to draw on Social Security? Well, the age, uh, the youngest age at which you could draw Social Security was 65. Anybody want to take a stab at what the average uh, life expectancy was, was back then? It was 62. They didn't even anticipate that the average person would live long enough to ever draw on Social Security. And if you're lucky enough to make it to 65, how long did you draw on Social Security before you tipped over dead? It was basically about two years. So in summary, when Social Security first started out, you had all these people putting money in, hardly anybody taking money out. And when they took it out, they took it out for two years and they died. Social Security was, was uh, basically set up to last forever. And then something happened. Uh, soldiers came home from World War II, and they started to do something at a rate at which they'd never done it before. What they started doing, they started to, that's right, they started to procreate. They started to have children, okay? Um, here's the problem, okay? These baby boomers didn't have nearly as many children as their parents did. In fact, they had 32 million fewer children, and here's where the math to which David Walker refers really catches up to us, because if you look at the ratio of people putting money into Social Security today, I mean, think about it this way. You can draw money uh, from Social Security starting at age 62, and if you start drawing that money at age 62, how long will you continue to draw before you tip over dead? Well, guess what? Um, a lot of times when we think about life expectancy in our country, the number 77 or 78 pops up. That actually is life expectancy. So that includes infant mortality and all the bad things that can happen to you up until age 62. The truth is that if you make it at 62, start drawing on Social Security, you will continue to draw on Social Security on average until age 85. That's 23 years. So Social Security went from an uh, insurance policy against living too long and it slowly morphed into this pension program that covers us for nearly a quarter of our lives. And David Walker says, hey, you think Social Security is bad? Because Medicare is five times more expensive. Medicare is five times more expensive. These two programs are like a fiscal 
cancer that are eating us from within. So, folks, why am I even bringing this stuff up? I'm bringing this stuff up because the number one thing that you have to do if you want to get your clients to invest in tax-free vehicles is you've got to convince them that tax rates in the future are likely to be dramatically higher than they are today because if you can't do that, they will not be prepared to pay a tax at today's rates, put that money into the tax-free vehicle with the expectation that tax rates down the road, um, with the expectation that they can then take that money out tax-free somewhere down the road. So, folks, if you cannot convince someone that tax rates down the road are likely to be higher than they are today, then you're pretty much dead in the water because nobody wants to do tax-free if they think that tax rates during retirement are going to be lower than they are today. But here's the fact. The fact is that the math dictates that tax rates have to be higher in the future. And you know what it used to be that I would tell clients, hey, in some distance, amorphous, unknowable future, maybe 10 years down the road, tax rates are likely to go up because that's sort of that vague deadline that David Walker and some other experts have given us. Well, guess what? I don't know how many of you have been paying attention to this recent tax cut, but guess what? Whereas before we thought that tax rates somewhere down the road would be higher than they are today, we now know, given the sunset provision in this new tax code, that we know, now know the day, the year, and the day when tax rates are going to go up again, okay? And that's January 1st, 2026. So guess what? You and your clients, I guess all of us, we are on the clock. We have the ta a tax sale, the likes of which we are not ever going to see again in our lifetime. And guess what? Every year that goes by between now and 2026, where we fail to take advantage of these historically low tax rates so that we can get money into tax-free vehicles like Roth IRAs and life insurance is potentially a year on the back end, meaning after 2026, where we could be forced to pay the highest tax rates we are likely to see in our, in our lifetime. Um, guess what is a great way to get people to start to embrace the idea that tax rates in the future are going to be higher than they are today. One of the ways is simply giving them a copy of the, of the Power of Zero. And the reason I tell you this is because the first chapter of the Power of Zero is dedicated to the proposition that we are at the lowest tax rates we're going to see in our lifetime. Tax rates will never be lower than they are today. And in a rising tax rate environment, there is an ideal amount of money to have in your taxable and tax deferred buckets. Okay. Now, let's identify these different buckets real quick because it's important as you are presenting these concepts to your clients that they recognize that there's different types of investments and that there's ideal amounts of money to have in each of these buckets. So, for example, the taxable bucket basically says this is your emergency fund. This is anything that generates a 1099 each and every year. The taxable bucket, those dollars get taxed as they grow, okay? Um, which makes them inherently efficient. But another characteristic of this bucket is that they're very liquid, which means that they make for great emergency funds. And what do financial experts tell us about how much money we have in emergency funds? Basically three to six months, okay? Let's call it six months. So there's a perfect amount of money uh, in that bucket. So can you have too much money in that bucket? Absolutely. It happens all the time. I got a couple that came into my office. They lived through the Depression. They said, Dave, we got nine CDs for 100000 each in nine different banks, and we think – we may be paying too much in tax. Are they paying too much in tax? Yes, because they got way too much money in that bucket. So more of the stories that relate to the tax, taxable bucket is that you can have too much money from a tax efficiency perspective. You can have not enough from an emergency fund perspective. Anything above and beyond that six months amount worth of basic living expenses should be systematically repositioned to tax-free. If you can make that case to your client, that they have too much money in their taxable bucket, then you can also make the case that that money should, any surplus funds should be repositioned to tax-free. Uh, tax-deferred bucket, okay, let's talk about tax-deferred bucket. Uh, I'm going to say this slowly and I'm going to repeat it a couple times because um, it's, it's got to sort of home in on what we're talking about here, but in a rising tax rate environment, there's a perfect amount of money to have in your tax-deferred bucket. What is your tax-deferred bucket? You don't pay taxes as your money grows. When do you pay the tax? You pay the tax at the very end when you take the money out. These are our 401Ks or IRAs, our SEPs, our SIMPLES, 403Bs, 457s, 
you guys get the idea. Now, there's two things that these investments have in common, these tax-deferred investments. Number one is the manner in which they're taxed upon distribution. The IRS has a very special word that they use to characterize this income when you take it out. They call it uh, ordinary income. What does that mean? That means that when you put money into your IRA or 401k, all you really did was defer the receipt of that income until some point much further down the road. And when you take the money out, at what rate are you taxed? whatever the tax rate happens to be in the year you take that money out. So, folks, you could have a million dollars in your IRA, but unless you can accurately predict what tax rates are going to be in the year you take that money out, do you really know how much you have? The answer, of course, is no. You don't have to know how much you have. It's very difficult to plan for retirement if you don't know how much you have. Okay? So uh, putting money into 401Ks and IRAs is a little bit, like going into a business partnership with the IRS, and every year the IRS gets to vote on what percentage of your profits they get to keep, not a very good business partnership. So there's a temptation at this point to say, well, maybe we shouldn't have any money in our tax, well, or, or, sorry, our tax deferred bucket, to which I would respond, well, number one, the one thing that we can all agree upon, even Susie Orman, uh, Dave uh, Ramsey, Clark Howard actually agree upon this, there's a rule of thumb with your 401ks, put in up to the match, but not a penny above and beyond. Do whatever's required to get that free money, then move on to the next best thing. Um, also, remember, when you retire, you're going to have a standard deduction, which if you retire today as a married couple, that's $24,000. That means you could take out up to $24,000 out of your 401ks and IRAs without paying any tax at all. I'm here to tell you that is the holy grail of financial planning. If I have an IRA where I got a deduction on the front end, it grew tax deferred, then I take it out tax free. There's nothing else out there that beats that. That is absolutely the holy grail of financial planning. So you want to have that as part of your portfolio of streams of tax free income. I would say for most people that don't have pensions, that perfect amount on their tax deferred bucket is going to be about $250,000 or so at retirement. So in summary, in your taxable bucket, you want to have about six months worth of basic living expenses. In your tax deferred bucket, I'd say put it up to the match in your 401k, but not above and beyond, so that by the time you retire, you've got about $250,000 or so. Guess what? Everything above and beyond those amounts in those two buckets should be re systematically repositioned and tax-free. And what sort of of uh, investments qualify as uh, tax-free? Well, we've got Roth IRAs, we've got Roth 401Ks, Roth 403Bs, we've got Roth conversions, okay? And we also have uh, what I call the life insurance retirement plan. Some people call it permanent life insurance. You can call it uh, equity index universal life. You can call it variable life. But the point is this. This is a bucket of money that gets treated differently for tax purposes than anything else we've talked about so far. What happens is you put money into this bucket, and as your money grows, your bucket begins to fill up. Only the IRS says that the growth of the money in this bucket is going to be treated under a different section of the IRS tax code than any of these other investments we've talked, so, talked about so far. What, what does the IRS say? They say that this money, okay, as your money grows, you get no 1099. What does that mean? That means you don't pay tax as your money grows. And then when you take the money out, if you take it out the right way, it does not show up as reportable income on your tax return. What does that mean? That means it's tax-free, and more importantly, it doesn't count as what we call provisional income. Provisional income is the income the IRS tracks to figure out if they're going to tax your Social Security. Most Americans who have too much money in their tax deferred bucket, have so much provisional income that they give up up to a third of their Social Security, which causes them to run out of money five to seven years faster than they otherwise would have. So that's a big deal. Uh, when you have this LIRP, you don't have to deal with any of that. They're also going to tell you that there are no income limitations. Let me ask you this. Can Bill Gates do a Roth IRA? The answer is no, because he makes too much money. You start making north of $199,000 of modified adjusted gross income. You can no longer do a Roth IRA. Can my children do Roth IRAs, the oldest of whom is 17? The answer is in order to do a Roth IRA, <clears throat> you have to have earned income. And my kids work. I just don't pay them. So 
the point with this bucket, this LIRP, is that it doesn't matter if you make too much money or not enough money, you can still put money into this bucket. Um, and then there's another thing that I'd love to talk about, and that's what we call it is free from legislative risk if history serves as a model. And what do I mean by free from legislative risk? Well, basically what I mean is um, – <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Um, in Cedarburg, Wisconsin, I have a client who in 1963 signed up for the Wisconsin State Teacher Pension Plan. And one of the inducements they said was, hey, if you sign up for this plan, we're going to give you your pension state tax-free. And he says, that's great. Uh, sign me up. Well, he signs up in the very next year, 1964. They change the rule, and they say, now we will tax you at the state level. Um, in retirement. Or now we will t tax these pensions at the state level. Well, fast forward 30 years, he gets his first Wisconsin state teacher pension check. Do they take out state tax? The answer is no, they don't. What do we call that kind of a clause? We call it a grandfather clause. Well, guess what? They changed the rules on this bucket of money three times in 82, 84, and 88, and every single time they changed the rule, they simply said, whoever has the bucket, um, before the rule changes, gets to keep it and continue to put money into it under the old rule for the rest of their lives. We call that a grandfather clause. So a lot of people now look at this bucket and they say, gosh, this bucket has everything. It's like the alignment of the stars. Why not just put all my money into that bucket? Well, first of all, is it ever a good idea to put all your eggs in any one basket? And I say no, but not only that, the IRS says if they're going to give you the benefit of an unlimited bucket of tax-free dollars, they're going to require that there be a cost of admission. They're going to require that there be a spigot attached to the side of that bucket through which flows on a monthly basis some expenses. And what do those expenses go towards? They go towards the cost of term life insurance. It's annual renewable term life insurance, which most people need, okay? Now, if you're rapidly approaching retirement, your house is paid off, your kids have moved out, um, a lot of people say, well, hey, now is when I'm going to start dumping my term life insurance. And the companies that sponsor these programs recognize that. So in most cases, they've done something to sweeten the pot. They simply say that in the event that somewhere down the road you should need long-term care, they will give you your death benefit while you're alive for the purpose of paying for it. I will tell you this. If I reach top of the table every year, I'd say that half of those policies that I sell, I would never sell if not for the long-term care provision. Most of my clients are between 50 and 65. They're all dealing with at least one parent at that moment in their lives who needs long-term care. So it is at the forefront of their thoughts, okay? So they're all asking themselves, we don't want to be in the position like our parents where we have these long-term care events, but we don't know how to pay for them. So, folks, let me tell this to you in a very clear terms. People aren't opposed to having long-term care insurance. They're just opposed to paying for it. If you can show them a way to get long-term care insurance without feeling like they're paying for it, that is a huge, huge winning proposition for most people. By the way, I'll also tell you, you may want to write this down. People are um, – you don't have to love life insurance. You don't have to love life insurance companies. You just have to like them a little bit more than you like the IRS because in the end, someone's getting your money. Okay, let me repeat that. You don't have to love life insurance. You don't have to love life insurance companies. You just have to like them a little bit more than you like the IRS because in the end, someone's getting your money. At least with the life insurance, you're getting something useful in exchange for your money. You're getting a death benefit that doubles as long-term care. You're also getting an unlimited bucket of tax-free dollars. It doesn't have all the strings attached to it like all these other tax-free investments that we're talking about. So um, I don't want to go too long here, but let me give you four takeaways that I think that if you absorb these into your practice would be absolutely huge for you. Number one, tax rates in the future are likely to be dramatically higher than they are today. Mathematically speaking, there's simply no way around it. We've got the proof. We've interviewed all of the experts. They're all looking at the same numbers. They're all saying the same thing. Tax rates have to rise dramatically or we go broke as a country. Did you know, for example, Larry Kotlikoff out of Boston University, he says a lot of people think that our national debt is $21 trillion, but that doesn't account for all of the promises that we've made that are, um, that are not paid for. 
Uh, Larry Kotlikoff says that our debt to GDP ratio officially is only about 106%. But he says if you look at all of the things that we've promised to pay that we can't afford to pay, our debt to GDP ratio is actually 1,000%. Let me give you an idea how bad that is. The second place country is Japan. They're at 250%. That's four, we're four times worse than the second place country. And even worse, while every other country in the world is getting their fiscal house in order during this period of relative economic prosperity, what are we doing? We're continuing to charge the credit card. We're the only country in the world that's doing that. So mathematically speaking, there's nowhere for taxes to go but up. And that's a, that's, that's a concept that you simply have to drive home with your clients. And if you do, it really sets the, sets the table for the discussion of tax-free, one of which is uh, life insurance, of course. Um, the second thing I would tell you is the power of zero. There's, the only way to truly insulate yourself from the impact of higher taxes is to get to the 0% tax bracket. Why? Because if you're in the 0% tax bracket and tax rates double, two times zero is still zero. Okay? So that's a huge, huge concept. You are sitting on the train tracks, and a tax freight train is bearing down on you. The only way to get yourself off the train tracks is to simply uh, get your money repositioned to tax free. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, a few years ago, I was watching the Roadrunner, and who's always trying to kill the Roadrunner? Coyote, right? Well, in this particular episode, the coyote was building a bomb with which to kill the Roadrunner inside a um, shed, okay? made by Acme, of course, and he was so fixated and intent on finishing this bomb that he didn't realize that the Roadrunner had pushed this little shed onto the train track. Maybe you've seen the episode. And he was so fixated and intent on finishing this bomb that he also didn't realize until the last possible moment that there was a huge freight train bearing down on him. Now, very important question I'm going to ask you. If you found yourselves on a train track with a huge freight train bearing down on you, what would you do? You'd get off the tracks. You'd haul yourself to safety, right? Well, let's go back to the coyote. The coyote sees this huge freight train bearing down on him, and instead of jumping out of the way, what does he do? He simply pulls down the window shade, thinking that the act of doing so would make the problem go away. Did the problem go away? No, of course not. There's a huge explosion, and does the coyote ever really die? No, kind of frustrating, but as the smoke cleared, you could sort of see him sort of, limping off screen very much the worse for wear. Well, the reason I tell this story in all my workshops is because <clears throat> the average American has a huge freight train bearing down on them, and it's bearing down on them in the form of higher taxes, okay? Um, because the average American is investing the lion's share of their, their savings in what we call tax-deferred vehicles, okay, like 401Ks and IRAs. So your job is to get your clients off the train tracks. Now, takeaway number three is this. I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, I put thousands of people on the road to the 0% tax bracket. Notice something very interesting. It is impossible to get to the 0% tax bracket with just one stream of tax-free income. Nearly impossible, okay? Getting to the 0% tax bracket requires multiple streams of tax-free income, none of which show up on the IRS's radar, but all of which contribute to your clients getting to the 0% tax bracket. And by the way, it's nearly impossible to get to the 0% tax bracket without using life insurance. And takeaway number four is, I've said this already, but January 1st, 2018, we're all on the clock, okay? We, we're, this is the biggest tax sale we're likely to see in our lifetime. And every year that goes by where we fail to take advantage of historically low tax rates, potentially a year on the back end where we could get forced, could be forced to pay the highest rates we've experienced in our lifetime. Now, a lot of people say, well, Dave, how am I supposed to bottle up this message and unleash it on my clients? And I say, well, um, that's where the Power of Zero book comes into play. Um, basically, what you do is you buy the book and send it to a client with a little handwritten note. It says, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, the other day I was reading this book, and as I was reading this book, I couldn't stop thinking about your situation. Do me a favor. Read the book. I'll call you back in a week. Let me know what you think. Well, there's a farmer's agent. He's a, he's a P&C guy. He sells home and, and car insurance out in Vegas. The best year he'd ever had selling life insurance is $40,000 a year. His name is Jeff Benuto. He doesn't mind me using his name. The first full year, 
he did that strategy. He would send the book out to his clients. He'd say, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, the other day I was reading this book. As I was reading this book, I couldn't stop thinking about your situation. Do me a favor. Read the book. I'll call back in a week. Let me know what you think. First full year he did that, he did $363,000 of life insurance premium, finished number one in the company. Okay. All he does with farmers agents now is go around and talk to these guys about how he uses my book to sell more life insurance. The second full year he did that, he did $365,000 worth of premium, finished number one for the second year in a row. I was speaking at the Ed Slot Elite IRA Advisor Conference a couple years ago in Coronado, California. A guy comes up to me and he just hugs me and I said, what, what do I do? He says, I did a million dollars of premium in eight months since I started handing out your book. Now the flip side is this. I had a guy out in Colorado that said, Dave, I bought 40 of your books. And I didn't sell a single policy. Well, I said, well, did you follow up with them? And he goes, I didn't know that I had to. So the moral of the story is it is a great, great tool to be able to set the table for a discussion about life insurance. It does all the heavy lifting for you. It does the convincing that tax rates are going to go up, and it explains why, and it, does, and it, and it explains what the LIRP is and why it can help them, and they usually will come back to you afterwards and say, tell me more about the LIRP, but the key is you have to follow up. So um, the reason I'm on this, I'm actually calling from New York City. Um, I've got Bloomberg Radio tomorrow. I'm going to appear on, um, on TV as well. And then Thursday we've got CBS. The reason we're doing this media tour is because um, – <clears throat> About a year ago, Penguin Random House said, hey, Dave, you sold a lot of books. We're interested in publishing this book. So Penguin Random House, which is also about three blocks from my, uh, from my hotel room, they said, Dave, we want to update and revise your original book. Um, so it's now including all of the updated 2018 tax law change. There's a new chapter on the Trump tax cuts and why I think these are the lowest we're likely to experience in our t lifetime, and how your clients can take advantage of the sweet spot. There's a sweet spot so big in the truck tax cuts that you can drive a semi-truck through it. There is a massive, massive sweet spot for people who want to get to the 0% tax record. And when they read this chapter, they're going to recognize that not a year should go by where they don't take advantage of putting as much money into the tax tree bucket as possible. So... Um, <clears throat> I think that my, my time is far spent here, but um, Rollin, if we uh, uh, want to uh, open it up for questions, I'm uh, happy to do so uh, at this point. Dave, thank you so much for uh, your insights and wisdom. Um, I think Marsh is actually facilitating the night, but uh, we'll go ahead and let Marsh continue to do that. But yeah, so if any of you have questions for David, uh, now is now the time to ask. Yeah, so we have we have quite a few people on the phone call right now. So if anyone on the call or anyone here wants to ask a question, you're going to unmute yourself by doing star six. And then if, just try not to wreak havoc. If there's more people talking, then obviously just stop talking. Because um, we don't have a way of raising hands or anything. So um, if there are any questions, any questions here in the room or any questions on the phone, um, feel free to ask away uh, right now, and then if not, then we will uh, thank Dave for his time and let him be on his way. So we'll. Any, any questions in here? John Moody, go ahead. The subsequent book, I can't remember the name, the title, that talks about structuring. You look before you lurk. No. Yeah, look before you lurk. Uh, it talks about making sure that the, the, the I'm going to call it I I U L or the LERP is structured properly to make sure that it's gaining, you're getting, it's going to be cost effective. What are some of the checks and balances that you would recommend be taken into consideration? Yeah, so you're, uh, so you're, you're, you're referring to the sequel to the powers here, which is look before you LERP. And I basically said, okay, Starting a life insurance policy is a bit like getting married. Nobody wants to get 10 years into this and realize they married the wrong person. Um, and so uh, a lot of people buy life insurance just because the guy across the table from them gives them the warm fuzzies. But I say, hey, look, there's 
a lot more that goes into this lifelong relationship that you're going to have with your life insurance policy than the salesman gave you the warm fuzzy. So we should all be sort of keenly aware of what goes into a good life insurance contract. And one of those things is how it's structured. And so what, what we always tell people is you want to buy as little life insurance as the IRS requires of you, stuff as much money into it as the IRS allows in an attempt to mimic all of the tax-free benefits of the Roth IRA. Um, these, these life insurance policies are front-end loaded, meaning they're going to pay most of their expenses in those first 10 years. So the expenses are a little bit higher in the early years, but they're much lower in the later years. But over the life of the program, the average expenses coming out of your bucket are about 1.5%. So um, most of you who are running these illustrations, you should, there should be a feature on your software that allows you to do uh, guideline premium, minimum non-MEC uh, premium. Um, so it's not hard to create an illustration that does that, but the general concept behind it is you want as little life insurance as the IRS requires of you. You're stuffing as much money into it as the IRS allows in an attempt to create a lean, mean, cash-building machine that over the course of your life can actually outperform most mutual funds, most Roth, Roth IRAs, most, 401, most 401ks. Awesome. Thanks, David. Hey, I, I do have a question for you, David. Um, you mentioned that the majority of your clients are between the age of 55 and 65. Um, are you referring to your...